uh, three years in Japan with my family living there. Um, I attended um, meditations at uh, Buddhist monasteries where we would have green tea. Um, green tea was obviously a huge part of the culture. Um, my husband and I have traveled um, throughout the world, sometimes with our kids, sometimes without, and experienced um, tea culture in Morocco and various other places that my brain is shorting out on right now. Um, but my husband and I enjoy uh, brewing our coffee by various methods. Um, we're kind of connoisseurs, maybe a little bit of coffee snobs. Um, and I grind my own chai, which is kind of one of my like points of pride. <laughs> I make some really amazing chai tea with my own little mortar and pestle that I'm very enthusiastic about. So I think that's why I'm here. <laughs> okay. Christy Gilbert. Um, I'm Christy S. Gilbert. I am an independent editor with Loose Leaf Editorial and Production. And I've been editing science fiction and fantasy for a decade or so in that position. Um, and I'm on this panel because as part of my folklore training, I have a master's degree in English, but my emphasis was in folklore and uh, that as part of my folklore training, I did a lot of studying of food ways and the ways that people ritualize food and incorporate food into community. Okay. I'm Newell Wright. I am an author too, but a professor author. I don't write science fiction. I do academic writing. Um, I was on this committee or this panel because last year I was on the alcohol panel and I talked about alcohol consumption around the world. And I made the point that there's a whole culture of alcohol about we as um, largely LDS practitioners know nothing about. And I've traveled as an international business professor to over 50 countries. I've spent significant time around the world and I've observed coffee and tea culture everywhere. So I did not know I was on this panel until like a week ago. And then I found out I was the moderator too. So I suspect it was my participation in the alcohol panel last year that landed me this gig. So without any further ado, let me pose a couple of questions to the panel. Why do you suppose there are some countries like Japan and the United Kingdom that are tea countries where coffee consumption really hasn't taken off? And there are other countries like the United States where coffee is the dominant drink, not tea. Um, I, I could start. I, I feel like there's there's a, probably a lot of um like historical contingencies in there, you know, um, like where like the the relationship the that country has with the production of um, either coffee or tea, right? I mean, because in the case of the UK, it was it was very much like this luxury item imported from from you know one of their their you know not you know, at first a kind of business partner and then, you know, later on just, you know, in a colony basically. And so they had, um, you know, so I feel like their, their, like that relationship was probably, you know, part of what might have like uh, enabled that to like have dominance. Because maybe, you know, I don't know not much about the importation of coffee to, to the UK, but I would suspect that it was perhaps like less easy to get or was, was not something that was as promoted heavily um, by the government. I mean, like the, the East India Tea Company was, you know, an actual government operation right so like there was a kind of like heavily in, interest i suppose in kind of in promoting um the the shipment of tea to the uk and it's interesting um you know japan uh obviously is still very much uh, a heavy you know tea drinking culture it also now has has a, has a very robust coffee drinking culture um which is I would I would say kind of more from from Western influence, and you know you go to a country like Korea, which has basically switched from being a primarily tea drinking culture to a primarily coffee drinking culture. Um, you know, it's it's it's. I, I went to Korea a few years ago, and it was honestly hard to find really good green tea there, which just shocked me. But it's it you know it's it's easy to find a coffee shop. You know, like every two like every every block has at least two or three you know i mean they're just everywhere so so it, it's it if i i feel like um the cultural influences you know that i think it had, must have a lot to do with trade i mean that's that would be kind of my guess like mm -hmm. how the, the extent to which trade can match a kind of like cultural understanding or like a way of relating to that drink and if those two things you know 
click, then I think that's probably what ends up becoming more dominant. There's an interesting business story about how coffee was introduced to Japan in the 1970s. They started introducing mocha flavored ice cream because nobody had tasted coffee. And it went from there to foreigners coming. And now everybody knows about Starbucks, but Starbucks is still targeted mostly to non-Japanese consumers. So, mm -hmm. all right, other comments? Um, oh, um, go ahead. Christy go ahead. Gilbert? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it also has to do with uh, what grows. Um, Camellia sinensis is your tea leaf, and that was prevalent all throughout Asia, whereas um, coffee began in Ethiopia. Um, and then once it hit um, Islamic countries, uh, then it caught on because it allowed um, Muslims to be able to stay up late and wake up early in order to say their prayers. Um, so the way that coffee kind of moved through the world, I think delayed coffee's big catch on in Japan. But um, I would definitely agree that the coffee culture in Japan is growing immensely. Um, I think I saw coffee more than green tea. Um, when I was there, it felt like green tea was, uh, tea itself felt much more traditional, um, whereas coffee was much more, kind of metropolitan um, for a lot of people. Okay. Um, Christy Gilbert, any comments? Oh, I was just um, going to throw in there that I know that in various parts of Europe, when in like the 15, 1600s, when coffee was starting to move out of the uh, like kind of, you know, uh, like the Arabian Peninsula and areas like that, when it was starting to move into Europe, there were actually like anti-coffee movements because it was like that Muslim drink. And so Christians uh, who were like reactionary Christians would oppose coffee on the grounds that it was Muslim. And so that may have slowed it in some areas. I don't know if that specifically relates to the UK and it definitely didn't stop. I mean, in Italy, there was a big push and Italy loves its espresso. So it's not like it stopped coffee at all, but, <laughs> but that, that could have influenced some areas in being slow to adopt it. When I was in Dubai, well, and, we went around a roundabout and in the roundabout were three big coffee pots. So it just shows you how big coffee has infiltrated into the Middle Eastern culture. Christine, were yeah, you well, and coffee, oh yeah, that um, coffee has actually uh, become the acceptable vice of Christianity. Pope Clement VIII baptized coffee <laughs> um, I actually wrote down a quote when I was researching for this, where he said, why this Satan's drink is so delicious that it would be a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. <laughs> and pardon me using that language, but that was a direct quote from him. Um, so he's essentially saying, uh, it's, it's too good not to baptize it and call it ours. <laughs> um, so that was, that was appropriated <laughs> by Christianity. And around, that was in the 1600s. Well, th uh, let me give a factoid that you might find surprising. Coffee is the second most valuable commodity in the world after only oil. So Makes sense to me. another question to consider, when is coffee and tea consumed? Before a meal, during the meal, after the meal, in the morning, in the noon, in the evening? And how does that vary across the world? I would say it depends partially on culture, but also on your coffee drinker. Um, and, and is this coffee and tea or coffee? coffee because I feel like tea. they're not, because uh, they're kind of, I mean, if you ask my husband, like, when do you drink coffee? He would just say all the time. <laughs> um, because it, it, like, you can wake up with coffee, but you can also have an after dinner coffee. Um, you, you don't drink it with a meal. Uh, because that, I guess that feels a little off. But um, I mean, as far as tea goes, I feel like tea. It depends on how late you want to be up, <laughs> you know. But that's Do interesting. I, I feel like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I feel like like coffee has more um, certainly now of a of a kind of cultural understanding of of a drink that wakes you up in a way that tea doesn't. Although obviously they both have caffeine content. Um, but, um, you know, like, 
I don't know from what I remember. And, and I, the last time, you know, when I was, was in Japan was now like 20 years ago. So this is definitely, you know, out of date, but, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't offered really green tea in the morning, you know, like I'll do that now, but just because like, that's kind of how I've culturally interpreted it. But like, it was, it was something closer to a kind of separate moment in the day. Like if you went to the tea ceremony or if you, or you went to visit someone and they would off, they would always have like their pot of hot water and they would always, you know, it's like constant, you know, and they would just always offer us, um, because we were exchange students and, you know, we would go and visit people and there was just like a constant stream of green tea going down our gullet, my gullet. <laughs> like I drank everyone else's green tea. So, you know, that, I feel like it's, it's interesting because it obviously, you know, served the, that purpose of, of maintaining alertness, but it wasn't that sort of like that morning jolt thing that we associate with, with coffee. And I, um, I wonder like if there is like a culture in which like that kind of moment of waking up is associated with tea. Like I'm almost thinking like maybe it's something like yerba mate and in, in, you know, Argentina or Uruguay, but you know, but that's again, it's something that they drink like all day long. Although, you know, they'll start in the morning. So. <laughs> that's technically a morning drink if you start, that, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, but I do think that like in America, coffee is very much ritualized as part of the morning. The like best if, part yeah. of waking up. <laughs> yeah, like right, exactly. so many people, like if I haven't had my coffee, I can't talk to you and be a functional person. Um, like that's part of the ritual of being awake is like you get out of the bed and you have coffee and without those two things, you haven't technically woken up. And so it's like a gateway to the day. Um, but then uh, like the after dinner coffee is also very common in many cultures, especially uh, in the area where co coffee originated, where it's more like an excuse to extend dinner conversation for as long as it takes you to sip the hot thing and beyond. But so right. I think it's serving like the ritualized morning coffee is serving a function of like a daily ritual that begins a day, whereas like the after meal coffee, like it's normally after dinner, as I understand it. And it's more to extend an experience that you're sharing with a bunch of other people. Morning coffee is isolated. After dinner coffee, right. it's more like shared experience. Individual as opposed to communal. Yeah. I live in Mexico now and the, the coffee has a kind of interesting, different kind of way of, you know, people understand it differently or, you know, like they have different cultural nuances to it. And, and something I have noticed is that after dinner, it's not even really after dinner because the big meal of the day isn't dinner. It's it's like around three. Um, so it's like after your evening supper <laughs> and they and and you and you drink like um cafe de olla, so it's like like coffee with sugar and cinnamon and no milk. Um and they just boil it. You know, it's like it's like the most simple method of of making coffee. It's like gra boiled grounds and like the grounds are settled to the bottom and that's it. Um and it's, I just, it's, but I, I hadn't really experienced that. And it is, it's very much like this kind of communal thing. And they'll get, you know, and like my, my like little niece here <laughs> like drinks it, you know, I mean, it's, it, they'll, they'll water it down, you know, but they, it's, it's very, it's very common and kind of, yeah, like familiar, sorry, familial, familial. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, kind of interesting in Belgium. I've spent probably more time in Belgium than any other country. In the evening, the coffee is drunk after the meal with dessert. And it's always um, provided with a l little plate of cakes and cookies and chocolate. Chocolate and coffee go together in Belgium uh, very well. Um, I had some Belgian friends come to the United States about three years ago, and we went out to dinner with them, and some of the Americans drank coffee during the meal. And my Belgian friends thought that was positively barbaric, absolutely barbaric. <laughs> <laughs> what speaking of rituals what rituals do you see around either coffee preparation and consumption or tea preparation and consumption i mean i think the fact oh, that oh sorry no, go um, ahead go ahead I... okay it's funny because there's a little bit of a delay and so every time um I, what i think is interesting is that there there is ritual at all how, how many things do we eat on a regular basis that have 
a, a, a ritual that, that we set up a, a pattern, you know, either, you know, bringing that family together or um, to me, coffee and tea is med- med- meditative. It is calming. Um, it's not so much. I actually rarely drink coffee in the morning. Um, for me, I really kind of like it as a pick me up when I get tired in the afternoons. Um, or I really enjoy it with dessert in the evenings. Um, because to me, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's time out. It's time to be able to just sit and contemplate and hold this warm thing in your hands, um, and, and think, and it allows you also to talk more than food does because you don't have your mouth full of, you know, steak and whatever that you're chewing up. Um, so it has a tendency to allow conversation more than some other things that we consume. Um, and so while there are, you know, technical, like, elaborate, uh, rituals that certainly exist around tea and coffee, to me, it's very interesting that there are these very, um, simplistic mundane rituals that arise out of the simple pleasure of drinking coffee. And then also with tea, you have all of the accompanying um, medicinal benefits because you can unlock medicinal benefits of various plants simply by steeping them. And so, for instance, if I'm going to have um, rose hip and rose petal and hibiscus tea, I'm going to put that blend together with the intention actually of like focusing on myself for the time period that I am drinking it because those things have medicinal benefits um, that I am anticipating getting. So there's this whole mentality that goes with them um, that really slows you down. And I think that's so valuable. Others? What's the difference between drinking tea made in a paper bag versus in a ball or a metal container? I've actually been criticized uh, in various parts of the world. It happened in Belgium. It happened in France for drinking tea with paper. I was actually asked, can't you taste the paper? I mean, what are you doing to the – and it was just an herbal tea. But... You know, I don't – I, I tend to be someone who, I mean, now when I, when I drink green tea, I just let the leaves steep. I don't use any kind of barrier between the leaves and the, uh, the water. Um, I gather that this is like a kind of more or less traditional way of drinking green, of tea in general, because, you know, there would be no reading the tea leaves if we were always sticking them in balls or paper. Um, you know, and, it, and for, for um, you, you, you mentioned the, the name, Christine, of the plant. Uh, the scientific name, which is like fallen out of my brain, <laughs> Canalis. Can- <laughs> yes, that. Um, Canalis. <laughs> and it's so so like that plant like sinks really easily. It it honestly isn't. It's it's pretty easy to drink tea if it's just that you know is in the water. And I do notice that it has a very different um, effect on the flavor. Like it, it tends to, when I put it in a ball or in a bag, it tends to over steep the leaves on the outside and kind of under steep the ones on the inside. So you always end up with like, it's like, it's a thing that weird effect where the green tea ends up kind of brownie black and you're like, what, but you know, but it's supposedly green tea and it's kind of sour and it's just not good. Like you know, green tea really should be green and, and kind of grassy. Um, and so and if you get a good green tea, you can re-steep those leaves. But I feel like re-steeping them is like definitely you have to like give them air. So in Japan, what I saw was that people would would often just like have a big teapot, you know, and the leaves would just be floating around in there. And so then like there would be a strain on like the pour spout. And then that would be how it didn't get in the or most, you know, you get a little debris, but you wouldn't get like the whole thing. I just put it all in the in the cup because I, I cannot bother with all of that. I just need my <laughs> green tea. But I mean, but it's more or less like the same theory, right? So like that, to me, that that it is noticeable, but it's it's more noticeable the better quality tea you have. Um, if 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 it's a pretty low quality tea, I feel like it's kind of you know you might as well have the convenience of the bag. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, it's I I don't know. I feel like that is. Um, that's one of those things that we've ended up changing so much because of like, the modern world and modern conveniences. I mean, 
it's weird to think of wanting tea to be fast. I mean, I'm like, I literally am saying this, right? Like I need, I just want it. I just want it. But I mean, that's not what it, it like, that's not kind of the way it was developed culturally, right? Like we're talking about a, a, a drink that should take time. Um, as Christine was saying, you know, like it, it, it's, it's a kind of meditative moment. Um, and, 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 you know, in a lot of cultures still, it's, it absolutely functions as a kind of break in your day. Um, I mentioned yerba mate before, I mean, but it's absolutely, it's, it, it's like a thing that everyone, you know, has their little thermos and they have their like, um, um, the mate, like the kind of yerba mate wooden bowl, you know, and, and, and it's just like, it's kind of like a moment where like, well, now we're going to share, you know, we're gonna, and it's a communal thing too, right? Like now we're going to share our mate. And I, I feel like, you know, I understand why we put things in tea bags and we just have them on the go and everything. But I feel like you really take in the culture out of the experience. And yes, you can have the same flavor, but you're not going to have the rest of that context. And I think that context is really important for our culinary experiences. Mm -hmm. I think okay. especially with with ritualized stuff like like tea and coffee that do take a long time that uh, that convenience, those convenience elements are going to ruffle feathers, even if they make some people, you know, some people happy to have it quickly. Uh, it's going to violate some of those expectations of that ritual process. And like, uh, I, I feel like those like the infuser balls are kind of a middle ground where like it makes cleanup yeah. faster, but it's still like a tool that you've specifically chosen for just this thing. And it's like your ball. And so I feel like you can get away with it better with infuser balls and things because you, you've you chosen a ritualized tool for your ritual and it's not something you're throwing out when you're done. Yeah. Another question, when, go ahead. Mind if I add a thought to that? I just wanted to add that I don't think that there's, like you mentioning people kind of razzing you about using tea bags. That's actually the first time that I've heard of that. Like, I don't think that there is a prevalent uh, culture in tea where everybody is just like, if you use tea bags, I don't know, like you're not a real tea drinker. Um, like we're going to take your tea <laughs> drinking card away. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's there. I, I think that if you're going to get razzed about anything, you know, like, if you say that your favorite coffee is Starbucks, people might be like, okay. <laughs> the, the, like, they might wonder like what coffee you've ever had. Um, and you know, or there are things like that. Or, um, I think that in America, people get a hard time about putting a lot of cream and sugar in their coffee. Um, which is funny because it's almost like in America, we have this idea that coffee needs to be endured and not enjoyed. And like the tougher you are and like the nastier your coffee, like the more you love it somehow. Um, that to me is so backwards in, in the sense that like this thing came to the whole world as something to be enjoyed. Um, and I just like the Americano <laughs> like it's so fitting that that's the one that got named after us because it's literally war ration coffee. It's espresso with water and nothing else. And like that's the one that they named after us. So I feel like there's this utilitarianism with American coffee culture that may exist outside of it, but I, I certainly don't see it. Like I, to me, outside of the United States, people love the cappuccino they 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 love the look they love the art they love the cream um and so i think if anyone's going to give you a hard time it's it's kind of that kind of thing where it's almost like the, the the grin and bear it enthusiasts where they're like i really love coffee because i love this stuff it's like it came out of an elephant's butt i don't know like <laughs> whatever they're thinking so a follow-up question that when do people start drinking coffee and tea? I ask this because I did a study of consumption choices people made as they left high school and entered college. And one of the things that they, and this was mid nineties when I did this study, one of the things that they did start in college was drinking coffee, which they didn't do in high school. Although in high school they did drink pl plenty of alcohol. So when do people start drinking coffee? At what age around the world in different places? I don't know very much about this. 
Okay. Um, personally, I started in college, right? I, that That's definitely, like, maybe a little after, but it was, you know, what, what drew me to it was definitely the, I like writing in coffee shops. You know, I just had to buy something. And so eventually I started liking coffee. <laughs> okay. Well, I asked that because it was one of the DMARC, it was one of the markers of transitioning from childhood to adulthood was drinking coffee. It's almost like a rite of passage, at least in the United States in the South where I did my study. So, all right. Um, what's the function of willingly eating your vegetables? You know, like it may be a mark between childhood and adulthood, but where exactly that occurs, you know, couldn't say. It's almost like your palate changes and you begin to like things that are more bitter, possibly. Yeah. What's the function of drinking coffee and tea? For example, I bring this up because when I go to China, um, they tell us, those of us who aren't tea drinkers, that we need to drink a lot of water, but to always buy it in a bottle. Don't drink it out of the tap. Whereas they'll make coffee out of the tap because the act of heating up the water kills the problematic parts of the water that they tell us to don't brush your teeth with it, don't drink it or anything. So it actually functions as a way of hydration. We hydrate with water uh, and they hydrate with tea. And I noticed this in the Middle East too. The very first drink people would offer you was coffee and an awful lot of coffee was consumed. So what, what's the function of it around in various places that you've seen? I think at least many times it's just like the, it's coffee or tea, depending on the house that you're in, um, is just kind of like the first symbol of hospitality someone can grant um, because, because it's part of their home culture. It's part of, and, you know, we've talked about how you, you know, you sit and drink, you don't like guzzle hot coffee that would hurt. <laughs> so it's something that takes time. And so it's, it's kind of a hospitality invitation be like, oh, you're coming into my home and you're going to be here for longer than two seconds. Like you should have tea or coffee because we're going to hang out for a while. Yeah, I think coffee is, is that is maybe a function that has, has managed to retain itself across many different cultures and all sorts of different contexts is, is that it's an excuse to linger. I mean, that's right. Like that's my, why I started drinking coffee in the coffee shops because I needed an excuse to sit in that chair <laughs> and continue to occupy it so I could write, you know? So I would drink like these, these little flat whites like as slowly as humanly possible. They were always frozen by the time I finished them because I needed an excuse to, <laughs> to stay there. Um, and you know, that's what you're saying too, right? About like you go over to someone's house and the whole point isn't to like drink it as quickly as possible. It's to like hang out and chat. Mm -hmm. Or at night, you know, you 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 drink the coffee and, and you're hanging out with your family, and it's just like a, you know, it's a it's a reason to linger. And in a lot of contexts, that reason to linger is like an actual conversation. But it seems to me that we've maybe perhaps ported it in a lot of kind of American coffee culture without the social aspect, but with the lingering aspect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we have like we have coffee dates as as like part of the dating process, a coffee date is like the, we get to sit and have a conversation. And if you want it to end, you just drink your coffee fast. Right. And then you leave. But like, that's, it's, it's like the smallest possible time commitment where if you want to stay for a long time, you can like, you can draw out a coffee date for a long time. But if you, if you're like, oh, okay, we we're five minutes in and this, this was a mistake, <laughs> you can drink it quickly. And then it's, then the excuse to sit at that chair is gone and you can right. leave yeah okay as writers how do you incorporate coffee and tea into your stories are they interchangeable uh given the fantasy or science fiction genre how does that change your use of coffee and tea in the story i actually had a really interesting oh sorry <laughs> no i had an interesting experience with this um because i was one of the writers on Tremontaine, which was one of Serial Box's first um, series, like a serial stories. And they, and it's a, it's a collaborative prequel story to Ellen Kushner's Swords Point uh, novels. And in those novels, uh, she's always had her kind of, it's very much like kind of um, European fantasy, uh, it's kind of what you would call manor punk. So like very, very much like, like, um, like a fantasy of manners and swords play. And so she would, she always, she had already developed this world, you know, for 
decades before we came along and there were these characters didn't drink tea it was it was you know despite a lot of the kind of european um and, and even kind of british origins a lot of like the culture she was drawing on it was they were they were chocolate drinkers and i remember talking to her about this and i you know because i was in my master's program and i was like you know where are they getting this chocolate from you know because like i really have some questions because like the tea i could she because she said you know well i you should like you know they if you never notice it like my my characters they never drink tea and i'm like yeah now that i'm thinking about that i have questions right and so we had this like whole sprawling conversation ironically over tea in our kitchen and like at the end of that i was like telling her you know you really just just expand the world right you could just have chocolate traders and people from a kind of you know a mesoamerican analog like mayan traders come over and and like kind of rejigger the whole kind of way that the these these systems work in your novel no so this conversation came up again when she got the opportunity to write the prequel and so we ended up doing exactly that of like having these chocolate traders like come into you know i mean the idea is that they were always there but now now they're kind of being visibilized and like made into like the kind of central characters of the story right and so it it really opened up all sorts of different things in in what had been a, a pretty kind of in that sense standard um like medieval renaissance uh like fantasy world right where where you don't normally get to see that if you if you have like tomatoes or you know um or chocolate or you know a lot of these foodstuffs that you know actually are from the americas like most of the time you know that's just kind of like hand waved away even though there aren't really people from any kind of like cultural analog of that and so it was interesting to me to be able to like go in and and reimagine it in that way and it seemed to me like it was really necessary because because the second I thought about it, you know, like, what are they doing drinking chocolate? Like, how do they even get this chocolate? Like, you know, the chocolate, like that tree is not going to grow anywhere around there. Like, where is it coming from? You know, and so that, to me, I feel like that's, that's like the interesting thing about it. I, I, a lot of, um, I feel like it's, it's interesting because if you think about where these foodstuffs are coming from, especially in these ritualized drinks, especially in these things where, you know, like the second that people get a taste for it, I mean, like the market just becomes like this juggernaut. Like, I mean, it changes mm -hmm. like empires, right? So, yeah. so just like having it there in the background, I'm like, that's cool. But I mean, how much more interesting is it to really think about exactly where it's coming from and how it got there and like what those implications are? I, I see this sort of thing a lot when I'm editing manuscripts, when I encounter some European inspired, like it's it's all temperate or ice and <laughs> they've got like these tropical drinks that cannot grow there. And that's fine if you've incorporated the idea that there are trade routes that go right. other places. If they have technology that can cross oceans or if they have systems of caravanning. Um, but I think it's, problematic when you don't realize that coffee can't grow in the Rocky Mountains. Like it can't, it doesn't grow here. <laughs> so uh, it can't be a part of a culture, especially not an integral part of a culture, unless you can get enough of it from point A to point B. Like you can't have tea culture in Britain without the East India Trade Company, without all that massive amounts of trade. And so I think if you want to have these things in your world, then you need to be thinking about how you get all those things together. Just like you can't have linion berries in an equatorial place if there's no commerce to Sweden. Like you can't, it right. doesn't work. The plants don't grow. And I don't see that so much as a limitation, as an opportunity to think about everything your world could be. And it doesn't all have to be on the page, but if you want to have a super isolated place, then treat it like it's super isolated. And if you want to have a place that has access to lots of different goods and foods and rituals that aren't geographically restricted, then you have to acknowledge what trade and exchange and empire would bring. Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, but, uh, I got kicked out. <laughs> Glad sure. to have you back. <laughs> Well, and when considering the effects of trade, I think it's also important to think of the effects of exploitation. You know, you mentioned the East India Company and so little of that was trade and so much of that was um, exploitation in order to meet the incredible demand at the time. Um, for, for me, the way that um, 
coffee and tea have uh, appeared in my fiction and fiction I'm familiar with. Um, it is more the emotional aspect of having it. Um, but I love the consideration of the, the ecological and geographical possibilities of it, the um, large societal meaning. Um, but for instance, uh, my best friend, Chris Atkins, um, whose work is up and coming, she had a story that I can't say too much about because it's not published, but she had a character who was essentially obliged to witness um, deaths on the regular. Uh, just every day of her life essentially was just uh, this repeating pattern of witnessing death. And um, every time this happened, the character would come home and then go through a tea or coffee uh, ritual. Um, and it's so interesting because it gets to this point where it's borderline heartbreaking. Like the first time you see it, it's, um, you know, almost sociopathic, you know, the, the, we have this big opening scene and then she comes home and makes a cup of tea and pets her cat, you know, and you're like, what's wrong with this person? Um, but as the pattern of her coping, um, is repeated, and you're seeing this um, you're seeing this inability to be able to really process what it is that she's forced to go through. Um, the reader is then left to grapple with what's wrong with this situation um, rather than this person. And so to me, that was a very artful way of incorporating um, tea and coffee culture into a story in a way that um, felt significant. And then um, for me, um, uh, the story that I have in Beneath Ceaseless Skies is called My Sister's Wings Are Red. And it is this post-alien apocalypse world um, where there is this very small group of people who are trying to keep one human happy by making her food. And it's all it all takes place in um, England. And so it's all this very traditional English fare, um, but in this very bad situation. And the characters who have to prepare the food are not allowed to eat or drink any of the food that they prepare. And this is why I mentioned that it's kind of a love, a love story for Earl Grey, um, because the characters have this, um, what, what is it? Current? Is it current something? They have this like mush jelly that they have to eat and they're not allowed to have anything else. And what they do is they water it down and they pretend that it's Earl Grey. And the food in the story and the loss of food represents humanity and the loss of humanity as people have struggled for um, a species identity. Um, and the identity of human beings is connected to food in this story. One of the characters was a Michelin chef before the earth was taken over. Um, so for me, food just has these incredible ties. Like, you know, Christ himself broke bread. Like that's so, it's so significant, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm a very easily emotional person, but like, you know, we sit and we eat food with our families. Um, parents are strongly recommended from everyone, from scientists to child developmental psychologists to eat food with their family. Um, and to me, it just has this incredible emotional and spiritual significance that then in turn affects us physically. Um, and so whether it's, you know, coffee or tea in all of its thousands of forms, because there are so many different ways, um, so many different ingredients to tea, there's, there's no saying like, I don't like tea because it's kind of like saying, well, I don't like, you know, juice. It's like, well, in how many things does that cover? You know, like there, there's just so much. Um, so it's just, it's so interesting to me how these things that feed us spiritually and emotionally then feed us physically and our, our bodies are built out of these things. And so like coffee and tea to me are just very special forms of this kind of nutrients that we all take. Okay. Yes, I was just going to say that we probably ought to spend the last few minutes taking questions. All right. So we have a question from Lisa Catmull. 
What were Victorian coffee and tea habits? How are they different from today? No clue on my part. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, oh dear, I went out of focus. It's fine, you don't really need to see me. Um, I don't know super well, but I know that there are a lot of, I mean, Victorian, we're talking the UK specifically, not like the time period, right? We're talking like UK in that time period. Uh, there are a lot of traditional UK foods that are definitely created to be consumed with tea. Like they're meant to be dipped in tea, they're meant to be eaten and then have tea wash it down. Uh, and so I th think that's part of why some UK foods tend to be a little drier than American foods because we're not always dipping it in tea. And so like texture wise, we just don't need it to be as crisp. Um, but I don't know if that specifically emerged in Victorian England or if that was like earlier or later. Um, with Victorian England, you have the possibility of six or seven meals a day, depending on who all you're counting. Um, and with, with tea in there, because you have a uh, morning tea, you have afternoon tea, and then you have an after dinner tea. Um, there are two different dinners. There's one for the upper class, and then there's often a post dinner for the lower class. And that's when the lower class would be able to relax and have their tea because the work would be done for the day. Um, and as far as Victorian England goes, um, that's, that's pretty much what I know is that you, you have, you have an immense number of times you are sitting down to eat. And I think that that is significant. But um, you also want to consider how that's affected by the prevalent class system of Victorian England, because that would affect it big time. Because you'd have servants who would be skipping meals. They're not eating the same number of meals as the people that they're serving. Excellent. Question from Kiro Darkness. In the past, how big were tea or coffee ceremonies to everyday life? like a common thing or something that only the rich did, or was it something religious or uh, sacred? I think some of that depends on where you are. I mean, it's uh, like that, the answers to that are gonna be very locationally specific. Um, if you have easy access to something, like if it grows everywhere, then that's not gonna be divided by class nearly as much as something that is currently imported from across the world in small quantities. Um, so I think that's, I would have a hard time trying to answer that. I don't know if this is, you know, it's a little analogous. I, um, because obviously there's there's an element to kind of, uh, of democratization or something, you know, like that, that we now have access to so many of these substances, which before definitely had um, a kind of, differential class access at the very least. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in terms of chocolate, I mean, I can, you know, like I said, the kind of the adjacent subsister to these, um, to the coffee and tea, I feel like, you know, you could definitely, I can definitely say that the, that, co that chocolate was restricted to upper classes in, in pre-colonial um, Mexico or Aztec Mexico. It was, it was a ritualized drink. It was very much like a religiously affiliated drink. And so, you know, other people's ability to access, in fact, the cacao beans were used as a kind of money. It was like a, it was a, it was, spe it was a species, species, how do you, I don't know how you say that in English, I'm sorry. Um, so, but it was basically, it was, <laughs> it's like the words I only learned in Spanish, I was like, I'm a little, I have a bit of a hard time. <laughs> Just say it in but, Spanish, we can suck right. it up. Like. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I, so I, I imagine that there's a bit that that probably plays out in other cultures with regards to coffee, um, and tea, certainly I feel, um, but you know, that I would not know well enough to be able to like say that definitively. So. Yeah, I think. Um... Okay. I'll just start and say there's a great free audible audio book by Michael Pollan called Caffeine that I'd recommend that you get if you're a member of Audible. It gives you the history of caffeine consumption uh, throughout the world.
Um, I just want to throw out there that if you like listening to Alaya talk about food culture and how it can impact your stories, I believe she has a seminar coming up later this year about <laughs> culinary systems and speculative fiction. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I do. And it is like all is going to be full throttle, all of this. So that's like very exciting. <laughs> I personally am very sad that I can't sign up because I have to teach a class at that exact same time slot. So I'm super sad. <laughs> Any final words, Christine? Um, I, I did have two thoughts on the last two questions. One, on the Victorian one, the idea of re-steeping tea is another one. Um, like if I, I don't know what class this character would be in Victoria and England, I'm assuming. Um, but if someone is very, very poor, you could reflect that by re-steeping tea um, and not having tea, it's uh, fresh tea for themselves. Um, and then the other thing with uh, ritual, it does depend so much on where exactly you are and when exactly you are. Um, but just one of my favorite kind of like coffee stories is that um, when the Ottoman Empire was at its height, coffee was so important that young women um, like trained to be able to make coffee the best they could um, because when it came time for them to marry, they would go to the matchmaker, make coffee for the matchmaker the husband you got depended on how good that coffee was, um, which is just an amazing reflection of how much that culture valued uh, coffee. And um, that to me is also an example of world building being affected um, by something that was so desirable to people um, because, and then it had the ties to Islam as well, um, which is what made it so important and so prevalent in that culture. Aya, any last words? Um, I I think no. I feel like I've been I've learned so much on this panel. Frankly, I'm like I I I just just love all of these these kind of world building details and how how deep we can go just discussing two and a half food stuff. Because I will always mention chocolate. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> always mention chocolate. I approve. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. thank you.